in hour two, I'm Brooke Baldwin. Top of the hour, a day of emotion, day of anger and tears, plus survival. Today, we watched as Ariel Castro was sentenced to life plus a thousand years without parole. And as we watched, we saw this young woman, a survivor, Michelle Knight. Here she is in the same courtroom, face to face with her captor of 10 plus years, the man who kept her for really what has amounted to a third of her life. She was the first to be captured. Michelle Knight spent a decade in this home on Cleveland Seymour Avenue. And for the first time we're seeing beyond the walls inside from Castro's sentencing hearing showing just what it was like inside this prison where Knight, Gina de Jesus and Amanda Berry were locked up, held in the upstairs bedroom using 99 feet of chain. They were tortured, they were starved, they were physically abused, they were raped. And this gun here used to intimidate these women, keep them living in fear. Moments ago at Castro's sentencing hearing, Michelle Knight, who was impregnated by Castro multiple times, was starved, beaten until she miscarried. She stood strong and addressed her captor for the first time since her escape. Here is her response in its entirety. My name is Michelle Knight, and I would like to tell you what 11 years was like for me. I miss my son every day. I wonder if I was ever going to see him again. He was only two and a half years old when I was taken. I look inside my heart and I see my son. I cry every night. I was so alone. I worried about what would happen to me and the other girls every day. Days never got shorter. Days turns into nights. Nights turns into days. Years turn into eternity. I knew nobody cared about me. He told me that my family didn't care. He tormented me constantly, even on holidays. Christmas was the most dramatic day because I never got to spend it with my son. Nobody should ever have to go through what I went through or anybody else, not even the worstest enemy. Gina was my team teammate. She never let me fall. I never let her fall. She nursed me back to health when I was dying from his abuse. My friendship with her is the only thing that was good out of this situation. We said we will someday make it out alive, and we did. Ariel Castro, I remember all the times that you came home talking about what everybody else did wrong and act like you wasn't doing the same thing. You said, at least I didn't kill you. For you took 11 years of my life away, and I have got it back. I spent 11 years in hell. Now your hell is just beginning. I will overcome all this that happened, but you will face hell for eternity. From this moment on, I will not let you define me or affect who I am. You will, you will live, I will live on, you will die a little every day. As you think about the 11 years and atrocities you could inflict it on us. What does God think of you hypocritically going to church every Sunday? Coming home to torture us. The death penalty, penalty will be so much easier. You don't deserve that. You deserve to spend life in prison. I can forgive you, but I'll never forget. With the guidance of God, I will prevail and help others that suffered at the hands of others. <clears throat> Writing this statement gave, gave me the strength to be a stronger woman and know that there's good, there's more good than evil. 
that there's a lot of people going through hard times. But we need to reach out a hand and hold them and let them know that they're being heard. After 11 years, I am finally being heard and it's liberating. Thank you all. I love you. God bless you. Thank you, Ms. Fine. Pretty incredible moment there uh, in the courtroom. You and I watched this play out on television, but you know who was sitting in there and watched this with his own eyes? Our correspondent, Martin Savage, who has just stepped out of this courtroom. And Martin, I, I, what in the world was it like to be sitting there and witnessing it in yeah. person? You know, I have to tell you, Brooke, that I think in a lot of ways we went into this courtroom thinking that it was going to be the crimes of Castro that were going to be remembered most, but the beauty of this horror that comes out is the fact that it is the words of his victims that anybody in that courtroom will remember more so because what you saw was their ability to go from being victims to triumph over whatever Ariel Castro did and now they truly are the victors in all of this but they went through hell in the process I mean I knew a lot of the law enforcement in there I used to work in this town grew up in this town so I know the attorneys know all the law enforcement many of whom are retired they came out of retirement just to be in this courtroom to watch what happened because wow. they had tried to look for these girls for so many years and so I have not often been moved to watch them being moved but they were deeply moved very small in stature but her presence Michelle Knight filled that courtroom with her courage. And you know, Martin, something else I noticed, because I was glued to this all day long, watching, you could see Ariel Castro as he was addressing uh, the courtroom during his rambling address. And at one point, did you notice he turned around and it looked like he was even addressing Michelle Knight, looking toward her, looking to the family spokespeople of Gina De Jesus and Amanda Berry. Did you notice that? Yeah, it was interesting, as you say, when Michelle Knight walked into the courtroom and everybody knew who she was and the moment she arrived and even Ariel Castro you could see he was like leaning over backwards he was literally trying to do whatever he could to get a glimpse of her Ugh. but he's also surrounded by some very big guards and they jumped up immediately and like linebackers set up a picket fence around him and blocked the view but you know what she paid no attention to him she would occasionally look in his direction hmm. but you could tell that by the look in her eyes that man meant nothing to her anymore it was just as if he really wasn't there she had incredible strength in the courtroom and, and everybody felt it i have to say like she said his hell is uh, is just beginning martin savage thank you so much for us in cleveland let's talk about this a little bit more jane velez mitchell host of hln's jane velez mitchell joins me also jeff tubin our uh, cnn senior legal analyst former federal prosecutor and danny savalos criminal defense attorney my goodness welcome to all of you there's a lot to talk about, but first, I just want to go, uh, Jeff Tubin. let's begin with you. Just quick visceral reaction to, to everything you witnessed today in court. Well, you know, I had a different reaction to, than you did, Brooke. I could barely watch it. I hmm. found it really so unpleasant, so repulsive, particularly, of course, Castro's remarks, which went on and on, and the self-pity and the narcissism and the just evil that came out of that guy. I really, um, you know, this is my job. I had to sit here and listen, mm -hmm. but uh, it was it was one of the more repellent things I've ever seen. In Jane, a Jane, what did you think? I, I agree. It was stomach churning and uh, toxic. And uh, this is a case study. It's an opportunity to look at the criminal mind and see how the criminal mind operates. And it's the hallmarks are defiance, denial, self pity, uh, rationalization, justification, lack of remorse, and also blaming the victim. That's what we see time and time again. Right. And that's what Ariel. Castro tried to do today, turn around and blame these women for their own victimization and say the most outrageous thing. Well, they wanted sex. They asked me for sex. That, I thought, was just it was obscene it was, beyond comprehension. Yeah, it, it made my skin it was crawl. Really, it made oh, my skin oh, crawl. Oh. I'm not saying I enjoyed it, but I watched every bit of it, maybe just because I covered it from, from, you know, when the whole thing broke in May. Danny, your thoughts? Well, frankly, I've never even seen a sentencing involving this much time. And to a lot of people, that may seem arbitrary, a thousand years. But when you start adding up the mandatory minimums and just the regular guidelines for all of these counts, this is actually a, not that unbelievable a sentence. I mean, he certainly agreed to take the death penalty off the table. But a thousand years, if you consecutive each of these sentences, in other words, they don't run at the same time, is probably in the area of reason. That's how awful what he did 
was. And it absolutely, I want to echo what Jane said. Yeah. It is surprising the level of uh, self-pity and self-esteem that, uh, that the criminal mind often has. And you see it. You have a rare opportunity to see it in this sentencing hearing. In just the brief words, the one opportunity this man had, his words were of re not remorse, but, uh, but telling us about how these sex acts were consensual. Uh, I Shocking. Think, I think you all and hit chilling. it too with the, with the narcissism because just watching him, I, I'm you know feverishly taking notes through this whole entire rambling address and it takes him like eight minutes to even get to some semblance of an apology. And it, at first he goes through each of these young women and finally he gets to Michelle Knight and that's when, you know, Martin and I were just talking, he actually sits there in his, you know, orange prison jumpsuit, turns around mm -hmm. to her and says this, watch. She's happy. Much of Michelle because Michelle, since day one, no one missed her. I never saw no flyers out there about her. I mean, Jane, I kept thinking when I heard that that. From day one, no one has missed you. I mean, he's shackled in court, and this guy is still trying to manipulate this young woman. Well, it's contempt. It's misogyny. It's contempt for women. And he, he also, again, is trying to blame her for what he did to her. And this, as we're seeing the evidence of the chains. I mean, this guy reconfigured his house to turn it into a dungeon. And he kept these women in a dungeon and tortured them and uh, impregnated uh, her repeatedly uh, mm -hmm. and then uh, forced miscarriages. And he's all in complete denial about this, having the nerve to say that they lived in horror. Harmony was the word he used. <laughs> Danny, I'm just curious, with all the, you know, many a courtroom you've been in, many a defendant you, you have seen, uh, when they get their chance to speak, is this typical behavior, the rambling, the defensive, the narcissistic, uh, the looking around, is this typical or not? Well, there's one part that I thought you see fairly often in courtrooms, and it was the moment where the judge asks does, if he's pleading guilty, and he, he wants to get in, this I see a lot, he wants to get in that angle where he says, well, I don't agree, I don't believe any of this happened, but I'm only pleading guilty to spare the victims the uh, agony of a trial. A lot of times you see in court defendants say, hey, I'm only pleading guilty, I don't agree to these facts, but the court must be mindful to get those facts on the record because that's really not pleading guilty. And the judge admonished him, he said, you pled guilty to this. This is what you pled to. There's no wiggling out of it now. Jeff Tubin, let me circle back to you because I know you say you found this whole thing, you know, uh, repugnant. Why then? What is the point of such a, a long, lengthy hearing? We knew about the plea deal last week. We knew what the sentencing would be. What's the point of this? Well, you know, there really wasn't a legal need for this to go on for that long. Certainly under Ohio law in most states, the victims are allowed to speak and the defendant is allowed to speak at a sentencing but the proof that the government put on wasn't entirely necessary I, I think the government was in part just trying to show the world what really went on here also establishing a factual basis so that if Castro down the line claims he wants to withdraw his plea um, th that would make it that much more difficult but if I can just raise one point that I know it's come up a lot on Twitter yeah. is like why why isn't he being executed why are we paying uh, to support him in prison. You know, this, this deal cheaper, that Ohio it? made, much cheaper. Mm -hmm. You know, litigation would cost millions and millions of dollars and it would go on for a decade, 15 years at least. Now, litigation is over. He will disappear into the prison system. Yeah. Uh, the government saved millions of dollars uh, by, by, by concluding this deal, spared the victims more testifying. Uh, I think this is a very good deal. No making money, and, no and writing Brooke, books for this man. Go ahead, Jane, real quickly. Yeah, I just want to say that I thought it was a very important process because if anybody out there thinks they can commit a uh, heinous crime and then simply plead guilty and they won't be humiliated before the world stage, this is proof that the crimes will be outlined and they were outlined in detail and I thought that was very important hmm. so that he couldn't maintain his dignity. He was humiliated before the world. And now for the rest of his life, HLN's Jane Velez Mitchell, Jeff Tubin, Danny Savalos, thank you all so very much. Uh, much more to come on today's emotional, shocking hearing in Cleveland. The city absolutely torn apart by this horrendous crime, a monster living among them, and they had no idea what was happening beyond these walls on this home on Seymour Avenue. We have new video today as city workers take those final steps before tearing Castro's house down. Coming up next, we'll talk to Cleveland City Councilman about how the community can now finally move forward.